Um, okay, so first thing off, you'll say, John, why are you teaching a class on music? Uh, and it's not a class on music, it's a class on congregational singing. And the reason I'm teaching is because I'm absolutely not qualified from a musical standpoint. I have two basic qualifications. One is I'm passionate about worship, and the other is I'm passionate about singing, and the two come together uh, in the, basically in this class. So um, it's, it's a hope that you will uh, acquire some of that passion as well. You know, music, music touches us in unique ways. It convicts us. It encourages us. It kindles our imagination. It helps us worship. It engages our hearts and our minds in worship. So it's my hope and prayer in the course of this course that uh, we'll together restore our wonder of worship through the use of song, that we will, uh, our worship will be intensified with maybe more engaged hearts and minds, we'll be more passionate about congregational singing as a part of worship, and more importantly, that we'll join our hearts and our minds together uh, in singing. You could come a little closer, and I can just get rid of this thing, but... Um, so, let's kind of get, let's get rolling... And make sure, well, let's see. There we go. That's supposed to, all supposed to be hidden slides. So much for that. All right, the passage that this, that this class is based on is from the fifth chapter of Ephesians. And if you're walking through Ephesians with Paul, he starts way over maybe in chapter 3, well, beginning of chapter 4, and he's telling them to walk together in unity, to walk as a new man, to walk together in love, to walk in light. Then he gets to walk in wisdom, and he says, therefore. So to walk this way, he says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So that's where we get the title of this series from, that's going to be basically one of our two touchstone passages. There's a parallel passage in the third chapter of Colossians where Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So, in one, he tells us to be filled with the Spirit. In the other, he tells us to let the Word of Christ, Scripture, dwell richly in our hearts by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs together. Uh, a couple of introductory comments. First of all, music is a very natural uh, component to our worship, it moves us, it touches us, it convicts us, it encourages us, it kindles our imagination, and it really in, it empowers or enables our worship in many respects. Um, and one thing to point out is worship wars are nothing new. You know, we talked about worship wars all through the 90s uh, and 80s a little bit. But in uh, 400, basically A.D., three-something, Ambrose and Augustine had the first worship wars. Ambrose loved music. He loved the power of music. He loved, um, and as you can tell, I like to walk, so I'm going to move this so I can walk. Um, and Ambrose wanted to use rich, powerful music in the service. Augustine was a little concerned about that. He thought, uh, Augustine thought, well, you know, the music might overpower the lyrics, and what's really important here is the lyrics. And you would think that's kind of natural because Augustine is a, uh, a natural theological descendant. Um, but it, uh, they disagreed. So you had the very first worship wars or music wars uh, within 350, 400 years of Christ's death. But we do know that God uses this in a powerful way and he brings it all together 
uh, when we worship him. So uh, here's sort of an outline of what we're going to do. Tonight we're going to cover rapidly um, everything from Genesis to Revelation and then the Revelation and the new church to the Reformation. Then next week we'll cover the Reformation to the 21st century. The, uh, the following week we'll talk about why do we sing. I mean, why do we, why do we sing in our worship service? The, the following week we will, and I'm not sure about the order, but I think this is the order we'll go, we'll talk about avoiding conflicts over personal preferences when it comes to singing. Because all the conflicts that you hear about they, they are based purely on personal preferences, so we'll talk about that. And then for a couple of weeks, we'll hear from some fairly significant teachers, John Piper, Alistair Begg, um, and Paul David Tripp, talking about the significance of singing in the life of the church, in missions, and in your personal faith. So that's kind of how we'll wrap it up. How many people... Heard the commercial. Did anybody hear? The, all right, so they take you back to 1971. You know, you could almost remember exactly what was happening, right? Just, just kind of remember that because we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up maybe with um, that hillside discussion. Okay, so let's talk real quick then about the history of congregational singing. First of all, why study the history of congregational singing? And for one thing, because the guy who's teaching it's a history major, and so I don't think you can learn anything about where you're going if you don't know something about where you've been. So that's part of it. But also because uh, it helps us to appreciate God's sovereign hand working throughout history. And I think you'll see that as we walk through particularly these biblical examples it helps us to avoid the imbalance or the overreaction that has happened through the years, uh, even between Ambrose and Augustine. Uh, and then it, it produces humility. When you stop and think that Charles Wesley wrote 6,500 hymns, and these are biblically based, biblically rich hymns, you know, he, Isaac Watts, uh, Franny C Crosby, they, they had scripture, they didn't have apps, they didn't have Google, they didn't have, you know, Bible Gateway, they got it the old-fashioned way. They read it, they memorized it, they learned it, they processed and applied it, and so it's very humbling to learn about these folks who, you know, wrote uh, 650 hymns in Watts's case, 6,500 or more in Charles Wesley's case. Some people say Fanny wrote over 10,000 hymns. So it's a very humbling experience. At the same time, it's inspiring for the future because if you look at history, every time God poured out his spirit in revival, what's the other thing that happened? He poured out his spirit among hymn writers. There's a tremendous outpouring of new hymnody in every major revival throughout history. And right now, I don't know whether it's the chicken or the egg, but right now we're seeing a huge outpouring of new hymn. And I'm not talking contemporary Christian music. I'm talking hymns written for the church to be sung by the church congregationally we have a huge outpouring right now that's happening, more than we've seen easily in the last hundred years. So that's why we're looking at the history. Um, there are a couple of things I need to kind of get straight, um, kind of pattern-wise. We, we're going to look at the pattern of God's people in worship. And one way to look at this is if, if, if we're... I saw a presentation, one guy by, by, by a guy, he hated PowerPoint. As you can tell, I live by PowerPoint. But he said, I don't need no PowerPoint. He said, this is up. This is down. Okay, so here's my version. We're, we're worshiping God in accordance with how he told us to worship. We're coming along here, and then all of a sudden, we encounter things in the culture, Right? 
and the, it causes us to deviate from that straight line, that's sometimes called syncretism, cultural influences, then God brings us to a point of convicting us of the wrongdoing. We repent of that wrongdoing, and then we attempt to reform and restore back to where we're back on track, where God wanted us to be, okay? So that's what this diagram attempts to illustrate, is that we're thing has a pointer somewhere, but anyway. We're, we're God-honoring worship is the straight line across the top. Then like the Israelites, when they it, went into Canaan, they, they encountered other gods. They, they adopted some of those practices into their worship. That's called syncretism. Then God convicted them that that was wrong. They repented and reformed and get back on track. And as we look through the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the modern, all the way up through the modern church, that's a consistent pattern that we see in the people of God, uh, God's, the worship of God's people throughout. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go through. One more thing, let's talk about a couple, a little terminology. It's easy to think that you're time period is the best or if you're like me I'm a, his, I'm a history guy and I tend to think some of the best times maybe were before all right uh, C.S. Lewis referred to thinking that your time is the best as chronological snobbery in other words you're being a snob to think that your time is better now than say times before or that we know more than people knew before and Bob Coughlin says that another term for that is uh, temporal narcissism. And I like that term even better, you know, which it doesn't matter whether you're in favor of now's the best or what used to be is the best. In either case, you think that time, narcissistically, that's the best. And temporal narcissism really applies very much if you stop to think in our current culture, you think about the cancel culture, you know, we know so much more than anybody did before. We need to cancel all those people because, you know, they were ignorant and dumb and stupid and didn't know anything. We've got it all figured out. And so we, we can be that way about our, our musical preferences as well. So those are two terms we're going to use pretty much throughout the course, chronological snobbery and temporal narcissism. So here's the big question. Who sang the first song? Anybody read the Narnia series? Uh, okay. Anybody read The Musician's Nephew? You read The Musician's Nephew? Okay. How did Aslan create Narnia? He sang it. That's right. He created Narnia by singing it. And C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Tim Keller will all tell you that in their opinion... That is what's happening in Genesis 1, that God sang creation into being. If you look at chapter 1, you'll notice there's an antiphonal kind of pattern. It says, and God did X, and then what does it say? And he saw that it was good, and then God did Y, and God saw that it was good, and God did Z, and God saw that it was good. You begin to see the pattern? I mean, it doesn't come across lyrically in the English, but it does much more so in the Hebrew. So God sang the first song, but if you don't want to go there with me and C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Keller, I mean, we're just, you know, we're just a couple of guys. Uh, but if you want to just go to chapter 15 of Exodus, uh, which is the first recorded song in the Bible, Chapter 15 of Exodus. Looks about right. Yep, okay. So what happened? In chapter 15, what's just happened? Hint, hint, hint. Okay, the, the Israelite, the, the, the Jews have just crossed the Red Sea. They've just seen this magnificent miracle. The waters have come back in and covered up the chariots and all the Egyptians. Uh, and into chapter 14, 
It says, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So what did they do? Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. And the whole rest of the chapter is the song that they sang. But the chorus is, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Now, it just gets better because you know what happened next. You got to be really quiet because, you know, we're Presbyterians. But, you know, Miriam, the prophetess, sister of Aaron, she took her tambourine. Heavens. She took her tambourine in her hand, and all the women took their tambourines. (laughs) And then, I mean, it just gets heretical. And they danced. And Miriam answered them and sang the chorus of what we just read. Sing to the Lord for his triumph gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. And right there we got the very first praise chorus before anybody invented a guitar. Exodus 15. But if you don't like that one... You don't find that heretical? <laughs> Look, it, it, a sense of humor is required to get through this class. Okay, that's better. All right. So um, then look at Deuteronomy 31. This is probably my favorite. And there are over 400 references of singing in Scripture. So, you know, it, to say this is my favorite. But this is reflective of the pattern that we looked at of the worship of God's people, the circular pattern, being influenced by the culture, syncretism, being convicted of the wrongdoing, repenting, and then reforming. In chapter 31, beginning in verse 16, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them, and they will, be, they will forsake me and break my covenant. Now, therefore, this is God talking to Moses. He says, do what? Write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For they have eaten, they will have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat. Then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be a witness, for it will not be forgiven, for it will, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behavior. In other words, I know what they're going to do. I know that they're basically going to turn to all these other gods and they're going to, quote, play the harlot. And so what does God do? He gives Moses a song, which, by the way, is all of chapter 32, is the song that God gave him. But it's... It's this. You know, I know that they're going to go into the land. They're going to be influenced by the culture and other gods, syncretism. So sing this song so it will convict them so that they will repent and return to me and reform what they're doing. All right, well, then that gets us to, um, let's see, there are other... There are, other use, there are other uses of song in the Old Testament. Uh, there's celebration of military victories. There's lots of preparation for battle. There's a returning of the ark. There's a completion of the temple, completion of the wall. All of those are occasions where God's people, congregationally, as a people, 
sang together. But the place that you probably thought we would have got, probably thought we were going to start anyway is the Psalms, right? I mean, that is the hymnal of the scriptures. So if you look at, uh, let's just say, why don't we start with uh, Psalm 100? You know, we'll just kind of take a nice even number. Well, look at there. It starts out, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp. Well, okay, so flip back. Oh, 96. Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Oh, 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation, and so forth and so on. They are, like I said, over 400 exa- uh, references to singing in Scripture. Forty of those are uh, indicatives or commands telling us to sing to the Lord. In fact, uh, Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper, what did they do before they went out? They sang a hymn together. Uh, A lot of uh, Bible scholars think it was probably a psalm somewhere between 115 and 118 is what they sang together. But you go beyond that, Jesus, the next day, Jesus is crucified and he's on the cross and what does he do? He quotes a song, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever looked at Psalm 22? I, I don't know why we don't preach more sermons on Psalm 22, but we don't. But, you know, the first verse is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then as he goes along, it becomes extremely prophetic. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me. My strength is dried up. My tongue clings to my jaws. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Very, very prophetic psalm. And we'll come back to that later in the course because there's some, there's some really good... Um, Example there with respect to individual song versus congregational song. So then we get to the New Testament, and the New Testament, the focus is on Jesus, who he was, what he did. You know, the examples we think of most of the time are Jesus' birth. You know, uh, the Magnificat is Mary's song in Luke. We got Zachariah's song. We have Simeon's song. You know, when they take him to the temple and Simeon says, Lord, you can bring me home now for I've seen your salvation. Um, Then you go all the way to Revelation. And what's happening in Revelation 5? You got the 24 elders around the throne and they've just had the discussion about, you know, no one is worthy to break the seal And what do they say? They sang a new song. In fact, some theologians say that Jesus himself was the personification of the new song. He was, in fact, the new song, like we call like we refer to him as the word. But they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God through your blood. It's a song. So, as we move on through the New Testament, uh, we get to Paul's epistles. And w- what's happening when Paul, um, Paul and Silas, well, first of all, Paul recites a lot of hymns in his, in his epistles. Uh, in fact, up here, handouts. The little handout is a list of examples of songs and hymns and spiritual songs in the scriptures themselves, some of which will surprise you. Uh, And the other one, this one, which is more than most people want, but this is a comprehensive, uh, you could call it a bibliography, but it's not alphabetized. But this is a comprehensive list of books, 
podcasts, uh, articles, et cetera, that sort of went into the making of this. If you want to dig deeper, uh, I'm going to recommend a few things as we get in, particularly the week we talk about why do we sing. Um, but I'm kind of checking my time. So when Paul and Silas are in prison together in Philippi, and suddenly the light comes on, the chains fall off, what were they doing? They were singing a hymn, right? And Paul turns around. Paul is in a prison cell in Rome years later, and he's writing the Philippians, and he quotes a hymn. So early, early uh, in the Christian church, we're seeing examples of hymns. In fact, the New Testament church was, uh, if you wanted to summarize it, you would, this is probably a good summary. It was manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. Worship was never lifeless, routine, or ritualistic. They were not just doing church, Okay. Singing was congregational. It took place among believers who had common relationships, shared joys, corporate purpose. It was not done in isolation. So sitting where, with your headphones on or your earbuds or I'm going to insult every male in the room in the tree stand by yourself is not the same thing as corporate worship. And even if you're humming along with your earbuds, it's not the same as corporate singing. Songs were intended to be sung with others. In fact, in 1 Peter, Peter tells us that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So what he's saying there is that it, we are not a building that houses people that are singing. Instead, we are a house, a figurative house that is made up of singing people. So it's a congregational thing. It's something we do jointly, something we do together, something that's shared. So the first thousand years of the church uh, is a little sketchy, but there are some interesting details. Uh, the church in many ways was born in song, lots of energy, devotion, commitment. In 100 AD, Pliny, who is a pagan, observes that the Christians were getting up every morning and streaming through the streets and singing about Jesus as God. And this is, this is a pagan historian that's making this observation. Um, then Ignatius and Clement they both encouraged Christians to sing with one voice as they met together. Uh, and by the time we get to 300 A.D., uh, there were many sacred songs being written in the early church. These would be in addition to psalms, for example. And then in 313, Constantine, 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 Constantinople, Constantine, legalized the church. And as soon as he legalized the church, what happened? We do what we do best. We divide. You know, we had disagreements over everything under the sun, so we divide. And one of those divisions uh, was a heretic named Arius. Uh, Arius was condemned as a heretic uh, shortly after this, but he was a really good PR man. So what Arius did is he wrote these little ditties. We would call them jingles. You might even call them commercials, but they were catchy. But they were heretical. And so Ambrose, you remember Ambrose, he's the one who disagreed with Augustine about, or, or Augustine, I keep, calling him, I keep calling him Florida instead of by his name. I just call him Gus. He disagreed with Gus because, remember, he wanted the music to be much more, he, he was much more interested in the impact of the music as well as the lyrics. So he said, okay, let's do this. So he and Ephraim, wrote new lyrics to Arius' ditties. Now, this has never happened before. Nobody in this room ever sang the lyrics of Amazing Grace to the tune of the House of the Rising Sun. I know you never did that. My generation did that. But I don't, you know, or maybe you sang it to Peaceful Easy Feeling by the Eagles. I mean, so this has never been done before, right? 
Well, Ambrose is the first to do that, and it, it, it worked out for him because the, Arius was good at writing the ditties. He just, had, he just had heretical lyrics. Again, uh, you know, early indications of early worship wars, so to speak. So, in the early church, by the 4th century, the value of the Song to Teach doctrine was well established. I said in the introduction, talking, you know, the two-minute thing, and we'll talk about Luther later, the purpose of hymnody is to sing the truths of Scripture into the hearts of believers. And this was becoming apparent by 400 A.D. And that's why Ambrose was so concerned about these Arius ditties, because it was getting into the hearts and minds of the people. So in order to suppress the growing number of heresies, the church began to exercise control over what everybody sang. So you have the Council of Laodicea, which said, if you're not sanitized, sanctified, and whatever else, and standing in the chancel, you can't sing. So in other words, they said, only the professionals can sing. So suddenly the congregation is no longer participatory it's, it's observing, it's becoming performance as opposed to participation. The formal liturgy developed, the congregation's becoming passive, uh, the mass is the approved liturgy, singing is delegated to the train choir, songs became more complex and foreign to the, co to the congregation, maybe because the songs were in Latin and nobody spoke Latin, you know, so yeah, it became more foreign. <coughs> then Pope Gregory dictated precisely what the choir could sing. You know, how, how, how many octaves and how many intervals in one thing or another. And that became what we commonly refer to as a Gregorian chant. And that was total control by the church of what was being sung in church. So, if you summarize the churches in the Middle Ages, the congregation was forbidden to sing. You know, it was, uh, service was mostly in Latin including the singing, so they couldn't participate if they wanted to, came less familiar with the truths that singing had been designed to reinforce. So that the people become more ignorant of the theology of the truths of Scripture because they're not singing it anymore. Corporate worship was no longer corporate. It's complex and ornate art form developed performance with minimal congregation participation. Now my question is, do we see that today? Do we see minimal congregation? And I don't care what end of the spectrum you are on. If you're over here with a big whopping organ and a huge choir, or if you're over here with a full 10-member band and all the microphones, both camps are guilty of leaving out the most important voice in the room. And that's you. That's the congregation. So we can, we can fall victim to being performative as opposed to participatory in either camp, it doesn't matter, or anywhere in between on the spectrum. If you are drowning out the congregation or if you are discouraging the congregation from participating in singing, then basically you're just back in the Middle Ages where the only people who were authorized to do the singing were sanctified and sanitized and in the chancel. Uh, the church became lost in the official musical voice, same, pretty much the same. So despite efforts to control the music, however, in the church, the people continued to sing in the streets and the pubs. So there was still song and even some spiritual song out there. In the same time, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux wrote, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, or Jesus, the very thought of these. St. Francis of Assisi wrote, All Creatures of Our God and King. So it wasn't a complete void, but it was pretty skimpy. And then came the Reformation. And we think of the Reformation as this great change in, you know, theological change. Justification by faith. You know, that's, that's the whole key to the Reformation. Uh, but you have the Reformation combined with the printing press, and suddenly God's people are restrained no more. And suddenly congregational singing is a major component of worship. 
In fact, Martin Luther is sometimes referred to as the father of congregational singing. He was an advocate for congregational singing. He's the one who said the purpose of hymnody is to sing the truths of Scripture into the hearts of believers. So he added vernacular hymns. Those are hymns that would be in the local dialect. So in his case, that was in German. So now they're singing hymns that are in German, in language that they understand in the worship service. Corporate singing is an integral part of his worship service. We'll see an example of that in a minute. I said hymnity is to sing the truths of Scripture in the heart. He composed himself 37 hymns. The one we know best is a mighty fortress is our God. We still sing that. In fact, on Reformation Sunday, I guarantee you that's what we'll sing. Um, Okay, so Luther was passionate about music. In fact, he was so passionate, I had to write this down because, you know, and just read it to you. But in an introduction to a particular piece, he says, anyone who does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper indeed and does not deserve to be called a human being. He should be allowed only to hear the braying of asses and the grunting of hawks. Now, Luther, you know, he, he, he kind of, says it like he thinks it. He just puts it right out there. Um, so you have this worship explosion. By, at Luther's death, there were 60 published hymns in Germany. 60 years later, there are 25,000 published hymns in German. So you got the printing press plus the Reformation. Luther recovered congregational singing. But there were other views in the Reformation besides just Luther. Calvin was more... Calvin was a direct descendant of Augustine, theologically. So Calvin was a little concerned that the music would be overpower the lyrics. So um, in Calvin's churches, you had only psalms that were being sung with very limited instrumentation. In fact, Calvin felt that the uh, organ was the devil's bagpipe, the reason he said that is because bagpipe refers to the Scots and the Scots and the Swiss and the Germans all didn't get along. So what happens in Geneva? All these mobs take sledgehammers and axes and go destroy all the beautiful organs in Geneva and throughout that whole region because Calvin said they were the devil's bagpipes. Personal preference strikes again. See, the, these, these are conflicts over what amounts to, there's nothing in Scripture about organs yes, organs no. Small instrumentation, no instrumentation. You know, acapella, great instrumentation. Praise band, choir. None of that's in Scripture. That's all basically evolved personal preference. And then you have Zwingli. So Zwingli said, Nah, this music stuff's really, really powerful stuff. So you can sing in the pub and you can sing in the street, but we ain't singing in the church. So, and we have some descendants of that philosophy today, you know, who, who uh, well, actually, not, I was thinking of those who sing a cappella and sing psalms only, but they would really be more descendants from Calvin than from Zwingli. So you had, you had different perspectives within the Reformation, but Luther was the guy who really brought back congregational singing. In fact, this, this, uh, this is a book about Luther. The Whole Church Sings. It's a good book if you're interested in Luther. But this author says, at every opportunity, Luther and his colleagues were concerned to get the whole congregation, not just part of it, involved in the singing, teaching them the need to sing the scriptural word, giving them the text and the melodies to sing and supplying the musical means by which an antiphony of unison and harmony grace their services of worship. Just kind of makes you want to be there, doesn't it? Just to, you know, just to hear them. Uh, that takes us up through the Reformation, and I like to end each session with something said by somebody smarter than I am, so that's not real hard to come by. Uh, in this case, Luther said, when it comes to worship, let God speak directly to his people through the scripture and then let his people respond with grateful praise. 
So that's what we're talking about. We will pick up next week uh, with the fathers of modern hymnody and bring that all the way through to current times in 21st century. Uh, anybody got any questions, comments, criticisms? Well, I think, I think when you're talking about Exodus, the examples in Exodus, the example in Deuteronomy, I think those terms are translated song. So it's more than just rhythmic reading. It is melodic. Um, it has melodic elements. Now, when I say Jesus sang a psalm from the cross, obviously we think he probably recited the text uh, from Psalm 22. It's just, it's just a way to get you to realize that Psalm 22 is in its origins, in itself, a song. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, well, let me close this up in prayer. Father, how we thank you for the gift of music and song, how it touches our hearts, how it can convict us and move us, how it can strengthen us, how it can strengthen our faith, how it can help us to overcome fear. Lord, we pray that you would grant us the earnest desire to join together with your people in song and worship. For we pray it in Christ's precious name. Amen. Don't forget the handouts are up here if anybody, those of you who